Welcome to Brian Lehrer Live. We're here live Wednesday nights at 7.30. Tonight, my picks for the four most Congress-transforming Internet videos of the election campaign. Then we'll debrief the impact of the web overall on the election results. Was this really the YouTube election, or was that just a lot of hype? And Liz Lorente of the Bergen Record will be here, named in a new book as one of the best reporters on race and ethnicity in America. Let's get right to those videos, and let's count them down. Why not? Web video number four contains footage of the disgraced Florida Congressman Mark Foley, who we all know by now wanted to have his way with those poor, innocent, if somewhat ambitious, teenage congressional pages. Foley's infamous emails would have done him in anyway, but someone dug up this footage of Foley on America's Most Wanted from a few years ago, and it was the shot heard round the World Wide Web. We track library books better than we track pedophiles and kids that are missing. We've got to force states to incorporate technology, share information, because we can't take another loss of life of a child. Absolutely. Right. I believe that every convicted felon should be mandated nationwide to give his DNA. It solves crimes, it gets innocent people out of prison, and it will it will eliminate the ability of these people to roam state to state in this country and rape people. From my view, when you rape a person, when you violate a child, you lose your civil liberties. So anybody that says we shouldn't take DNA samples, absolutely wrong. You commit the crime, you will supply the sample, and we'll be able to track and hopefully solve a lot of crimes. Well, good luck with your piece Thanks. of legislation, because you're, you're right, it, it will put some teeth into these registries. Well, if I were one of these sickos, I'd be nervous with America's Most Wanted on my trail. Well, I wish yeah, I could what, catch what all the of them. Web video number three for this election campaign made a difference in one of our congressional races right here in New York State. Republican Congresswoman Sue Kelly of Westchester served 12 years in the House until she ran into musician-turned-politician John Hall, formerly of the band Orleans, not Hall & Oates. This was not a good year to try to run away from controversy, nor was, was it a good year for Sue Kelly to cause controversy by running away from a Rockland County TV news crew who were trying to ask her about the Foley scandal. Kelly failed to even respond to the League of Voters or RNN TV. Today, she filed, she fled, I should say, from our cameras when we attempted to ask her about a number of issues, including the paid scandal. Here is how it looked when some creative soul re-engineered it for YouTube. She ran away. Web video number two of this election season comes from Pennsylvania, where voters retired the very right-wing Senator Rick Santorum. How right-wing? Well, as this mashup of Santorum and the president shows, it took him even longer than the president to accept certain realities about Iraq and 9-11. And that having, having a major military power like Iraq did, which had chemical weapons, which, which we have now found. The main reason we went into Iraq at the time was we thought he had weapons of mass destruction. It turns out he didn't. Was there a connection between Iraq and 9-11? Any connection? All, all, I, I don't think we know that. What did Iraq have to do with what? The attack on the World Trade Center. Nothing. And finally, our number one web campaign video for the election of 2006. You should already know what it is. Virginia Senator George Allen seemed to be cruising toward re-election and a presidential campaign when he decided to get, oh, just a little cocky with a video cameraman for his opponent who was following Allen around to his campaign rallies. So remember, Allen knew he was being taped when he directed these comments to the photographer, an Indian-American college senior born and bred in Virginia named S.R. Siddharth. 
My friends, we're going to run this campaign on positive, constructive ideas. And it's important that we motivate and inspire people for something. This fellow here over here with the, the yellow shirt, Makaka, or whatever his name is, he's with my opponent. He's following us around everywhere. And it's just great. We're going to places all over Virginia. And he's having it on film, and it's great to have you here. And you show it to your opponent because he's never been there and probably will never come. So it's good for you. inside the Beltway, or his opponent actually right now is with a bunch of Hollywood movie moguls. We care about fact, not fiction. So welcome. Let's give a welcome to Makaka here. Welcome to America and the real world of Virginia. So my friends, we're in the midst of a war on terror. Now, all the candidates caught in these videos that got massively forwarded around the web lost. So for any of you planning to run in the next election, don't forget to smile. Now we'll talk about the impact of the web in general on this year's historic election. Videos, blogs, commercials, the whole thing. Was it the YouTube election, as the New York Times has called it, or is that just a lot of hype? With me to talk about it is Jay Rosen, professor at NYU's Department of Journalism and writer of the blog PressThink.org. Hi, Jay. Welcome back to the program. Thank you so much. So was it the YouTube election? I don't think so. I think it was the Iraq War election and exhaustion with Republican rule election. But I could make a case. I could make a case that were it not for that Makaka video, the Senate would be in Republican hands today. It's possible. In that sense, uh, YouTube's entered into the life of the country, perhaps, or the, the Internet has, perhaps, in a new way. I buy that much. Do you think any of those others really matter to the outcome? I heard that Sue Kelly video cited a lot as something that was you know, used against her in a very, very close election. Who knows if that didn't tip the balance? It could. Uh, perceptions of the candidate, by, especially by interpreters of the campaign, uh, can have a big effect on the campaign, so it certainly could. And in the Makaka case, the James Webb campaign didn't even have to strategize to use it. It just really took off on its own. Right. This is part really interested me, Brian, uh, because we not only have um, more of the campaign recorded today, because there are more cameras out there and more people taping and, and just more surveillance, but we have a, a whole army of interpreters that didn't exist before who go to work on that material, and their judgments, as well as the professional politician as well as the professional reporter like now the, matter. Right, like the people who used uh, the Sue Kelly running away and turned it into a music video. Right, we have this, this new army of people who go to work on the raw materials of public debate and they, what they do with it is very different than what the pros and the people sort of in charge of the process have done. It's a different kind of media democracy than has ever been possible before. Yes, because we live in an era of expanded participation in the campaign, in media itself. Is it always good, though? Because I could argue that it takes, out of context, you know, the worst 10 seconds of somebody's life and blows it up and makes them an object of mockery. Yeah. And uh, it becomes too important. Yeah. Well, I think we're new frontiers in deception are upon us as well. Uh, like most things, there's a lot of good with it, there's a lot of bad that's brought with it, new, new ways of distracting people, new ways of ripping stuff from context and, uh, and sort of recombining it. So yeah, I think we're at new frontiers of popular deception as well. So viewers, we are going to open the phones and we are going to ask you, how did you use the internet during this election campaign? Give us a call, 212-251-0801. Did you view any of the videos that we just played? online, 212-251-0801. You should see the number on your screen. How did you use the internet during this election campaign? Did you use it to make choices between candidates to find out information about candidates you were considering? Did you use it to just get your own opinions confirmed? Did you use it to get politically entertained? How did you use the internet during this election campaign? 212-251-0801. Um, another new thing this year, I think, is that there was a whole wing of the Democratic Party mm. that now has a name, which right. is the Net Roots Wing. Mm -hmm. And they stood in contrast to the establishment wing of mm -hmm. the Democratic Party, perhaps right. nowhere as clearly as in the Senate race in Connecticut, 
where they helped propel Ned Lamont uh, over Joe Lieberman in the primary, though he lost the general election. Do you think there is such a discrete thing as the net roots wing of the Democratic Party? Uh, yeah, I do. Uh, I think it's a real constituency. It's, it's part of the party now. It's capable of a lot of disruption, and it represents people who realize they could participate in politics in a new way because of the Internet and have succeeded in crashing the gates, as the expression goes, enough that they have to be taken into account. And I think that they are a representation of the parties themselves having their boundaries broken, their, their, their borders crashed and uh, new entrants in the political process are here and they're gonna make noise and they know how to operate. So there's another question for you folks. Anyone who considers yourself part of the net roots wing of the Democratic Party, call us up and tell us what that means to you. 212-251-0801. Are you part of the net roots wing of the Democratic Party? What does that mean mm -hmm. to you? So when Ned Lamont lost the mm -hmm. general election, yeah. was that a defeat just for him? or also for this wing of the party? Well, it certainly would have been a victory for that wing if he had won, so certainly you could say it's a, it's a defeat. It's uh, the, the primary campaign and the maneuvering that goes on there is more of an intra-party thing. And so flexing your muscle within the party, that's one kind of power. Being able to deliver an election is another kind of power. They're not there yet. And the Times on Sunday noted that of the 19 candidates listed as Netroots candidate on the website Act Blue, which is a Democratic fundraising site, uh, of those 19 candidates, a majority lost their races. So maybe being a net roots candidate, at least today, can be a liability. You know what the net roots is, Brian? It's, it's people organized together who believe that politics is a, a participation sport. It's not a spectator sport. That's their main belief. And those people, in the long run, they're going to transform the party, or the party will wither away and some new one will come in its place that does realize the importance of that. Participation sport. Let's take a phone call. Here is Mark in Hell's Kitchen. Hi, Mark. You're on the air. Hey, how are you doing tonight? Good. How are you doing tonight? I'm doing great. Well, I, yeah, I certainly use the Internet this uh, voting season, just as, you know, people would send me emails that were more biased towards the Democratic Party. I, all, I saved them into one folder and then turned around and emailed that folder to everybody in my address book, everybody I knew, everybody I possibly could, so that they could see the issues and see... Uh, what crap the Republicans were giving us. And and, and from, from your pro-democratic perspective, were they mostly informational emails, sort of investigative reporting, dig out the facts kinds of emails, or were some of them, you know, look how wacky these Republicans are, politically what? entertaining emails, or what? It was, a, you know, it was kind of across the board. I mean, I have a whole range of friends, and my personality is, you know, can be very comical or very intellectual. And so I certainly went through and, you know, I was getting the stupid things George Bush would say or, you know, the thing that the Virginia wannabe senator tried to say. And I would certainly save those. But I also get really intelligent blogs of, you know, really hypersensitive issues and, you know, the difference between the Democrats and the Republicans. So and I just wanted to make sure that I certainly got my friends out voting and, you know, really used it as a kind of a mass telecommunication or mass okay. computer communication. <laughs> Thank you very much for calling. Thanks. And, and I guess uh, that's fairly typical of a lot of people these days. Just mm. judging from my own inbox, uh, a lot of people like Mark forwarded a lot of stuff to me as a journalist who gives out his email address. Right. Yeah, and this whole phenomenon, just the simple forwarding of emails and circulating information that way is an example of more people participating because they're not relying on some industry source for their information. They're informing each other. And everywhere you have a new pipe like that is, you have a need for a filter. And that's what our caller was. He's a filter for interesting emails that he sends to his friends. And uh, this is how people participate in their information universe now. They're filters for each other. Viewers, how did you use the Internet during this election campaign? 212-251-0801, 0801. And of course, uh, Mark said the, uh, the wannabe, uh, the guy who wanted to be senator from Virginia, George Allen, actually was the senator from yes. Virginia when this all happened, and he got booted out partly as a result of this. Mm. Um, that same Times article concludes that some big winners 
even though most of those 19 listed on Act Blue as, as net roots candidates lost, some big winners, including James Webb, the winner in Virginia, mm -hmm. were initially drafted by, by net roots activists. Right. And then they got out in the real face-to-face -face world, uh, these activists did, and gathered petition signatures right. for them after networking about who might get in, say, to run against George Allen. Right. See, in, in electoral politics, there's a period of low mobilization where possible contenders, possible candidates are floated, and there's kind of an early primary, which is usually among insiders, political operatives, reporters. And one thing that's happened is that that world that conducts this early primary, who's a viable candidate, who deserves party support, has widened. And it's possible for these outside groups like the Net Roots to say, hey, he is a viable candidate. This person should run. This person deserves a shot. And the number of people who can say that now is larger. Doug on Staten Island, you're on the air. Hello, Doug. Good evening, Brian. Nice to talk to you again. Thanks for calling. You know, um, as I watched everybody w worrying about, you know, torturing out this macaca and so on, I was wondering why what, what seemed to get lost in the weeds. He starts off by saying, we're going to run this campaign on positive, positive ideas. constructive ideas. That's right. And I just want to motivate and inspire people. And then he deliberately turns around to the one non-Caucasian in the crowd. And people didn't take note of that. And he's, I mean, it was shades of Ronald Reagan starting off in, where was it, Mississippi, Philadelphia? Or was it Philadelphia, Mississippi, I forget, where he started his <laughs> campaign playing the race card. And this gentleman just says, Alan, uh, pause, I, we, will, we want to motivate people. And this was as blatant as you could see. And most of the people I talk to watching on the Daily Cause or YouTube or Huffington Post or whatever the case happens to be, they saw this, but the media never picked up on it. They yeah, go, I think, oh, it's, well, a, I think it's a great point because it is, it, it is right there to be seen, which is, uh, you know, and this kind of thing is done in politics all the time. You say something that completely contradicts the way you act if the way you act is going to be unpopular. So he said exactly what you're saying. He said, uh, we're going to run a positive, constructive right. campaign of ideas. And then he turns right around and issues a racial, racial slur because he thinks it's going to motivate the people in that audience he was talking to. Right, exactly. Right. And, and now, the, yeah. So an, maybe enough said about that. Do the net roots and the establishment wings of the Democratic Party, do you think, come out more unified or more at odds after this campaign? Um, well, I don't think they understand each other yet. Uh, I, I, I think that, that the, the establishment of the Democratic Party still believes in, in controlling the message. And the net roots start to matter when you realize that, the, like you said, that, that in a lot of messages these days, no one's in control. <laughs> there's, a, there's a more open system. And so controlling the message isn't going to be adequate. And it can come back and bite you. There was at least one incident regarding Ned Lamont that left him in an awkward position because of what happened on the, net, on the web. Um, somebody took a photo of Joe Lieberman and put him in blackface. Right. And that got forwarded around. But then that got picked up by the TV stations, and it was an embarrassment to Ned Lamont and he had to publicly apologize for that, even though apparently he had nothing to do with it. Yeah, I don't think he had anything to do with it. Um, but um, new forms of risk are being created that the campaigns are not necessarily in control of. They don't necessarily know what their exposure is. Now, you can either try and prevent that from happening, or you can realize that this is the normal condition of operating. And that's a big shift for the establishment. Do the Republicans have a net roots conservative they wing? They do. But we shouldn't expect them to necessarily operate the same way if the parties don't operate the same way, if leadership doesn't operate the same way. So I think they're probably different machines, but there certainly is one. We yeah. don't hear that word, net roots, applied to the yeah. conservative. Obviously, there are conservative bloggers. There are conservatives online. But yeah. that word, net roots, is generally applied to the liberal Democrats. Right. Well, that's partly because the Democratic Party is more in trouble uh, understanding itself and, and sort of where its constituency is. It's less united. It's more fragmented. It's more directionless. It's I, been in the wilderness more. I have a Chicago Tribune quote here from November 3rd that says, Nielsen ratings, when they do actually rate the web with Nielsen ratings, same people who rate television, show Republicans outnumber Democrats on the web. 37 to 31 percent. Mm. I don't know how they come up with that number, mm. but does it ring true to you? Um, it would not surprise me. 
if that is the case. I don't know how they came at that, and it might not differentiate between people who are very involved in the web and those who occasionally use it. You're, you're talking about people who are participating in politics through the web. That's different than going to the web for information. Yeah. Do you, um, well, is the net roots wing, let me ask this a different way. Is the internet to the Democratic Party now what talk radio and maybe Fox News Channel have been to the Republican Party in the media? Well, it, it could be. It could be. It depends on whether the party actually wants more participation by more groups of people that it's not accustomed to dealing with. And it's not always the case that a membership organization like that wants more participation. Sometimes what they want to say is, leave it to the pros. So it depends on how they react. But it could be that. Gregory in Manhattan. You're on the air. Hi, Gregory. Hello, guys. How are you doing tonight? Good. Good. I was actually calling to see if there are any real hard numbers regarding um, all these people that are connected to the Internet actually then going to the polls as a result of their connectivity online. I mean, it seems to me it's very easy, you know, to just for everyone to just Google whether you're a Democrat or a Republican, some statement or some soundbite that supports the right. candidate. And it's Does it translate into actual, actual votes? It's a really right. good question. I don't know the answer. Do you no. happen to know the answer? You know, one indication, uh, a couple of indications. One might be that the number of young voters was up this year. It was up in 2004. Uh, it grew faster than the electorate as a whole by a little. The number of young voters was up again this year after years and years of complacency among the 18 to 30-year-old 18 to 30 year old group, right? right, 18 through their 20s. Right. And also, um, young people in that category voted overwhelmingly for Democrats this year, like mm. two to one, right. which is, you know, much more than they have in the past. So, uh, you know, that's, that's not to say that that's necessarily as a result of the web, but if we accept the, the stereotype that the people who are getting a lot of stuff online are younger, then there may be a correlation there. Yes, but we have to remember that Bush has been very good for participation. <laughs> people have, he has been great for mobilizing voters and interest in politics, as well as a lot of anger and rage and controversy and fanaticism. The Internet began to change how candidates raise money in 2004 mm. when Howard Dean and his presidential campaign started so successfully raising a ton of small contributions mm -hmm. on the web. Mm -hmm. Did you follow whether that continued this year or continued to change campaign finance? It, uh, it continued, but it, it wasn't a force for some new thing, a new person breaking in that wasn't expected. I didn't see that. Um, but it became a normal part of running the campaign, as did organizing people online to contribute um, you know, their support and, and volunteer effort. That became part of politics also. What haven't we talked about yet that you've been thinking about? Well, the bigger thing going on here is that the cost for like-minded people to locate each other, get together, and share information is going down in every area, business, uh, popular culture, education, politics. And that's the larger thing to keep your eye on. That people can now connect with each other, and people of common interest can, can connect with each other much more easily by themselves, without pros, without money. and that's what's going to change politics. Without Perot's? Russ Perot's? Pros. Pros. Professionals. They don't need oh, help. Pros. They can do it themselves. Right. I thought you meant the independently wealthy candidate, but that's the other trend in politics. It did take yes. a Ned Lamott, who was independently wealthy enough to largely finance his own campaign, right. to give Joe Lieberman that run for his money in conjunction with the net roots. It takes Michael Bloomberg in New York to defeat the Democrats, et cetera, et cetera. It still takes a lot of money, uh, or at least if you have a lot of money, that's one way in automatically. There was other thing we didn't talk about, though, which is the declining effectiveness of negative advertising was seen this year. It's not that it didn't work you know, everywhere or something like that, but it was less effective, and it's just becoming, there. maybe there's an immune system or something out there that's working, but it seems to be that this was not the way to go. And I think another new thing this year, and this was somewhat on the web and somewhat on television, um, that, uh, that we saw 
through the fall in this uh, web video campaign series that we're doing, that this is the final segment of, mm -hmm. the, the candidates turned those negative ads that were aimed at them uh, around. Right. And they actually, the candidates themselves would use clips from the negative ad or a mocking version of the right. negative ad to make fun of the negative ad against them. That's right. And this is what always bothered me when political reporters would say, well, negative advertising works, Brian. You have to understand that it works. Actually, the case has always been that negative advertising is a risk, and the risk environment can change. And I think that's what's happened, is the risk environment surrounding negative ads has altered. Do you hope the political Internet will do certain things, but fear it might do other things? I, uh, I definitely fear uh, the Internet because it is, in fact, enabling more people to participate, and it is therefore requiring of them more trust and civility to cooperate. <laughs> and whenever you do that, you you have uh, you have a lot of problems created too. So yeah, I think there's going to be new kinds of uh, uh, political sickness that are be enabled by the web and and lots of other bad things. But when you have more people in the system, you get that. You know what? I'm going to let uh, Gregory, who asked us the turnout question from Manhattan, have a follow up. Hi, Gregory. Hello again. I, I, I did want to mention, because uh, you're talking about negative advertisement and such, and how uh, it seemed this year, especially, people have really had their fill. One positive thing about the Internet, I find, is that it makes it much easier for the common man or woman to actually just hop online and find out the truth behind the spin and these sound bites. It's much more difficult for politicians to just run these blanket negative ads and have you done that with anything? Have you done that with a particular issue and researched it for yourself? Um, well, you put me on the spot here, but um, I, I can't recall anything specifically just off the top of my head. But in, in general, I mean, I, I, I do try to find out, um, at least to get the same news, news story from multiple sources. Mm. See how, like, you know, the, the, the Guardian in the UK, for example, is covering a story as opposed to the Drudge Report. Mm. Right. And, and you would go to both, because a lot of people, and this is one of the fears about the web, would use it as an echo chamber more and more, so that they surround themselves with the information that confirms what they tend to think in the first place. I wonder how many people are actually going to the Guardian site on the one hand and the Drudge Report on the other hand, rather than just going to, you know, Drudge and Powerline and all the conservative sites or all the liberal sites. Right, I mean, there's something to be said also for the level of disconnectedness that the Internet brings about. <laughs> and right. that's that echo chamber you're talking about. Thank, thank you very much. Tell us a little bit about your work. You're, you're involved in a fascinating online investigative journalism project now. Tell mm -hmm. us about your site. It's called newassignment.net. You can reach it at that address. And uh, we're trying to use the Internet to um, investigate stories that lots of people would collaborate on so that we can produce really interesting information that would be hard for a single reporter or even a team to do without this. So we're trying to take that, the, uh, the falling cost to organize people over the Internet into uh, reporting and start to put together stories that way. But I was thinking when, he, when our guest was talking, that I received a couple of years ago, Brian, a, a, a call that was a push poll. You know what a push poll is? Yes. It's where they try to introduce negative information in the guise of asking your opinion, right? Right. And it happened like in my kitchen. It's, it's a push poll, for those of you who don't know, is a way of trying to turn you off to a certain candidate. So they would call right. up and say, well, do you prefer candidate A or candidate B? And if you choose the candidate who they're against, they say, well, would you still support candidate A if, if you, you knew, knew that he was for baby killing? Right. Or whatever it is exactly. they throw out there. Right. And and this came into my home, and I wanted to find out if other people had had experienced this, and what, who was behind this, and what was the story. And I knew that if there was going to be anywhere I could find out about it, it would be the net. That's the only place I would ever find out about something like that that came into my life. And I think this is the promise of the Internet, is to bring politics closer to life and bring information closer to what happens to us. Let's throw in one more clip just for fun and to show that creativity did not stop on Election Day. Actually, Joe Myers made similar references to the failings of the insurgency, uh, including the <laughs> <laughs> support. And yet, 
this far into the operation. <laughs> said that you hadn't made changes to those recommendations. <laughs> the message that many of us people have is that the commission wanted to make major changes to that Okay, that was fake. And maybe you don't do that to a sitting defense secretary, but you do do it to a fired defense secretary. Jay Rosen, thanks a lot. Good luck with your project. It sounds fascinating. Brian Lair, thank you. Coming up in a minute, one of America's best reporters on our area as an immigration destination. This is Brian Lair Alive. Some of New York's most admired figures don't sell out concerts. They'll never be a running back for the Giants. And they probably won't go platinum. But to millions of kids, their teachers are still the biggest heroes in the world. Join New York's brightest. Teach NYC. Professors, outstanding students, illustrious alumni, all on the Emmy nominated magazine show about CUNY. Hi, I'm Diana Ravinka. Join us every week as we bring you stories about the people and programs that make CUNY a place where you study with the best. This is Brian Lehrer Live. We're here live Wednesday nights at 7.30. Now we continue our series with journalists featured in a new book and DVD collection called The Authentic Voice, the best reporting on race and ethnicity, published by the Columbia University Press. My guest tonight, Elizabeth Lorente, reports on race and ethnicity in New Jersey as a senior writer for the record of Bergen County. She does great stuff on new immigrant communities as well as existing racial groups and does not whitewash the conflicts or complexities of diversity in places like Patterson and Palisades Park, two of the places featured in her stories in the collection. Liz, welcome to the program. Thanks well, so much thank for coming you. in. Thanks for having I, me. I read in one of your articles and made a note that New Jersey is now 20 percent foreign born. Yes. Now that's not as high as New York City, but is New Jersey one of our most immigrant dominated states now? Oh, definitely. Um, occasionally, I would say it's either in the fifth or sixth rank in terms of the states with the highest immigrant populations and uh, and it's by no accident I think because it's next to New York. Next to New York the Statue of Liberty is in the harbor that's between the two places. Exactly so it's a natural beckon. The biggest immigrant group in New York City over the last 40 years is Dominicans. What are the largest immigrant groups in New Jersey? Basically you'll find the same just because there's a lot of travel back and forth. And right now there are Dominicans, uh, Colombians are growing um, astronomically, Mexicans, although uh, the tricky thing in terms of journalists and demographers uh, as far as Mexicans is that many of them are undocumented. And so trying to put a number on how many there are is always a challenge. But even, even so, the most conservative stats put them at about 150,000 uh, in New Jersey, and, which is quite startling when you think that many years ago, 
we thought of Mexican immigrants as, okay, California, Texas, Arizona, and now they are quite a presence more here. More and more here. I know fastest growing group in New York City since 2000. And I don't know the actual numbers. There certainly are not nearly as many Mexicans as Dominicans yet or Puerto Ricans, but the fastest growing group is Mexicans over at least the last five or six years, and it's getting to be a lot of people. Oh, yeah. Some of your reporting is about multi-group relations in, for example, in one of the stories in the book, Palisades Park, where Guatemalans and Koreans and whites all come into conflict and, or contact and to some degree conflict with each other in the same story. You want to tell our viewers a little bit about what happened in Palisades Park? Sure. Uh, what happened in Palisades Park wasn't unique and still isn't. Um, it's just that it uh, got the spotlight there. Um, what happened in Palisades Park is that like many uh, working class towns in the United States, uh, it was populated for a long time mostly by the descendants of Italian and Irish immigrants. And it, at one square mile, only one square mile, it really, really was the kind of town where everyone knew one another. And people would go to the downtown, walk into stores, and the merchant would say, oh, you're Peter's daughter. I saw your father grow up. And that kind of thing. There was that continuity. Some people liked to uh, liken, you know, the downtown, which was Broad Street, to Cheers. You walk in and everybody knows your name. Well, obviously that isn't the truth any longer because now uh, there's a large Korean population that came in the, 19, uh, the late 1980s uh, and some of them came straight from Korea and many of them, as is the case with New York, New Jersey immigration patterns, many of them had lived in New York and because they wanted perhaps something less expensive, uh, you know, went to New Jersey while often maintaining businesses in New York. Um, and so many Koreans went to Palisades Park and then sent word back to Seoul that there's a little town in New Jersey close to Manhattan, which everyone in Seoul knows, mm -hmm. uh, where you can get reasonable homes, reasonable price homes, good education, and still have our businesses in New York. And so the Korean population started coming into Palisades Park. At the same time, again, this little basically postage stamp of a town, one square mile, um, rather homogeneous for many years, saw a uh, migration from Guatemala. And the immigrants from Guatemala were as different as any immigrant group could be from the Koreans who had college degrees and uh, came with families and had already had an economic support system because, as you know, there's a system in the Korean community that I wish we all had where your relatives will lend you money to start businesses. The difference, the big difference with the uh, Guatemalans that many of them lacked uh, education well and, and legal money, status and legal status and many of them were were uh, single men with families back in Guatemala but nonetheless single men suddenly people see them standing on a state in a, in a uh, town Street corner, corner um, sometimes 200 waiting for work and of course that precipitated all these uh, stereotypes single Latin men mm, you know where do the whites come in because the review of your book in, uh, I'm sorry, the, the, uh, the, the review of your article in, in the book, and the book singled out that article as one of the best examples of reporting on race and ethnicity in America in the last 10 years, um, said that the reporting on the whites was really crucial to that story. Yes, yes, and, uh, and, and it was, and it amazes me how the, the reaction among journalists and others, but also among journalists, was that this was something so novel that that whites in a story about race uh, played such a prominent role and their voices were, were, were heard and strongly. And my reaction is, how can you not? How can you not go to the white community when what is race relations, but usually whites and another group Historically, it's been African Americans. More and more, it's Koreans, it's Hispanics. Uh, and so, 
how do you leave them out? You can't. Well, you had already established the conflict between the Guatemalan immigrants and the Korean immigrants. Did the, the whites in the community play a different role than the Koreans? Well, uh, the, the tensions originally were between whites and Koreans. Mm. Guatemalans were ignored happily for a while. Um, and uh, no, actually, let me let wait. Let me let me. Uh, it, it actually happened the other way. The the tensions originally were with the Guatemalans because of their illegal status, and also because they were single men, and a lot of people, especially women in town, found that scary, threatening. All these single men just on the corner, um, and who didn't speak English. Uh, there were fears about crime. You know, just, you know, that people would get raped, mugged, you name it. Was there actual fear. crime? No. No, they as a matter of fact, and this with came, any spike in crime? No, no, not at all. And it's one of those legends, urban legends, that takes a life of its own and is fueled by the stereotypes that people already have. But uh, the police department, in fact, was, the, was very emphatic about uh, 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 just bursting that rumor and saying these guys really don't give us any problems and you know they work hard do they occasionally have too many beers and get into disputes between mm, white people yes. white people never do that no of course not <laughs> barroom brawls no um, and so and so the police said yeah I mean you know they're not altar boys but um, but but it's not they're they Mm -hmm. certainly don't pose so a that threat was the original conflict. to the community. That was the, it was fears, and these fears were fueled by a mayor at the time who uh, basically used the illegal immigrants as the common enemy, you know, and, and contrasted the people of Palisades Park, the people who had been there for a long time, as he said, you know, our church-going residents versus the these illegal immigrants well when you interview the illegal immigrants you find out that very, they go to church it's a very catholic population they're very religious of course but you know obviously this was a coded kind of attempt to make it a saint versus sinner situation and so um and, and so Korea that was originally the story yeah and then the koreans were included in uh in his uh language about the uh, churchgoers? Or no, no, because it wasn't their turn yet. Uh -huh. Yeah, because, uh, you know, at first the whole we're being invaded um, fear was based on Guatemalans. And in a way it was because they were so visible, you know, and they were so tangible. The Koreans were coming in gradually and buying businesses that had been abandoned in the downtown because of the malls in New Jersey and the appeal that they started to have and, and the way they were taking people away from these downtown uh, businesses. And so many of the businesses were shuttered. And then Koreans came in and looked down Broad Avenue and like many immigrants do, where other people saw something hopeless, they saw an Let's opportunity. Go. Let's go. They saw an opportunity. They saw an empty uh, storefront and said, this is great. You know, and so they started opening up businesses. And then um, the more people you have opening up businesses and the more people you, you have who can then help others, which is what happened. Before you knew it, 90% of the 200 businesses in Palisades Park were Korean owned. Suddenly, not surprisingly, um, the Koreans crossed what sociologists call the tipping point, and that is when a certain population exceeds 15 percent and becomes a threat. So instead of rescuing downtown, after a certain point, they're seen as taking over. Well, yeah, which is often what happens at first. You know, you see this, you see this kind of. Um, just transformation in many areas like Miami, you know, with the Cuban immigrant population and uh, in, in many other areas where there's been an immigrant group that's come in and so-called rescued an economy. And at first, the feeling is gratitude. The fe and, and the feeling is gratitude and people champion it as an example of the American dream and look at what people can achieve here. And then after a while, after people are going to the downtown businesses and 
he's speaking Spanish, and I'm ordering coffee, milk, sugar, doesn't understand. Maybe this isn't such a good thing. They like the money, and they like, you know, the revenues, but now life is changing. So when you report a story like that, and you're sensitive to everybody's points of view, do you then leave it there in most cases? Here's how the whites tend to feel, here's how the Guatemalans tend to feel, here's how the Koreans tend to feel. Or do you try to take it to the next level and mm -hmm. draw some kinds of conclusions mm -hmm. that one group or another may not like? Yeah, you have to do that, I think, as a responsible journalist and with a situation as combustible as immigration. You know, it's not, immigration requires more than a ping pong reporting approach. The he said, she said, you know. Um, these stories will make it into papers because they're safe. You know, unfortunately, in our business, many people think that you don't really have to be thorough as long as you say, he said that she talks to Martians, but she said she doesn't talk to Martians. It's balanced. But that's what makes your reporting good, is you then take those competing claims and you say, let's investigate what he said exactly. and what she said. Are there Martians here to talk to? Right. Does she speak Martian? Right. Uh, et cetera, et cetera. Exactly, exactly. And, and so what you do is you actually uh, go, which to me, I mean, you wouldn't think it's rocket science, but it's done so little in our profession, and it's, it's not that hard to do. It does require a commitment of time, and you have to be, be dedicated to finding the story beneath the story you know and that is in your hands but the question of time often isn't and news organizations are not always generous about giving you time and don't always believe that the time that reporters are requesting is really necessary the story about Patterson New Jersey in the book revolves around conflict between new immigrants and African Americans right tell us the essential storyline there yeah well that I think is going to be uh, the major race story of this millennium. Um, it's no race, race relations uh, are no longer just explained by the Kerner Commission. White, black. Right, no. Um, now it's uh, white and everyone else, it's, it's blacks and a lot of other groups, it's neither black or white, but it could be Hispanics versus. Uh, uh, Koreans, it could be um, Cubans versus Dominicans, you know, but what you find, I mean, th it, but instead of complicating the issue, I think it actually helps us understand the issue because what you find is that there really aren't very many unique dimensions to these individual uh, tensions. You'll find a common thread, which is wonderful uh, in, in our uh, need to understand racial friction because what we find is that many of the things that, that uh, inform friction between Koreans and Hispanics, my goodness, echo some of the things that have characterized friction between blacks and whites. And so maybe if we look at that, and, and stop looking at, some, at, at it as something so particular and, and, and anomalous about black-white relationships, we'll understand that maybe we're just looking at something about the human condition. You know. So what happened in Patterson? What happened in Patterson is that, uh, interestingly enough, uh, what we've always heard in terms of comments based on fear and resentment that blacks and whites have made over the years and that we've become accustomed to hearing from one of those groups about the other group. My goodness, they were coming out of uh, the mouths of blacks about Hispanics and they were coming from Hispanics about blacks. And, and this is a particular issue, I guess, in places where um, the Hispanic population starts to outstrip the African-American population in terms of numbers. We know right. now that there are more Latinos than there are African-Americans in the country right. for the first time just in the last few years. Right, right. I mean, it started to percolate when they reached that magic tipping point, the 15%. Mm. And then aside from that, you have the language barrier, right? And then you have a population that already felt disenfranchised that already felt left behind. And now you have a new population 
that believes because it's it 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 it's what drove them here. It's what their parents raised them to believe that this is the land of opportunity. You know, this is the magic kingdom. You know, one thing that I see is a split between ordinary African Americans and black leaders, elected officials, and so forth. Just based on the calls I get on my talk show, the uh, black leaders tend to stand in solidarity with immigrant groups because they try to take a line that people of color need to stick together and it's going to hurt everybody if we start fighting among ourselves. But a lot of plain African American callers who aren't in the the so-called leadership community Mm -hmm. are very resentful of the competition that they see for work especially. Oh yeah. And especially as they see, you know, new arrival, uneducated, uh, barely or not English-speaking immigrants get preference for low-skilled jobs right? and leapfrog, as you say, over a traditionally disadvantaged community, there's resentment there. Right. Absolutely, there's resentment. And uh, But I, I have to say that I did see what, what you've seen in terms of the difference between black leadership and, uh, and the people in the communities. However, um, I think some of that, well, well, on the part of some, and this goes for Hispanic leaders too, um, you'll find many Hispanic leaders saying very sympathetic things about African Americans uh, in the community um, that don't jive with what the Hispanic community right. is saying. However, it's not totally always altruistic. I mean, these are people who want votes, and they're not going to turn away Hispanic votes. And so sometimes, especially when a group is becoming a majority, as the Hispanic population became in Patterson, it really doesn't make much political sense to alienate them if you want to run for office in Patterson. Interesting point. Uh, Was it in your story in the Bergen Record last month about America reaching the 300 million population mark for the first time that I read that Australia has a target cap on its population, and they're restricting immigration. So that in Australia, man, you think places like Utah have a lot of open space, go to Australia. But they don't want more than a certain number of people, whatever that is, in their country. So they have more restrictive immigration laws than, say, we have here. Are you familiar yeah. with that? Did I read that uh, in your piece? You probably did. <laughs> Interesting tidbit. Um, But you know, it's interesting because uh, I must say, I have written many, many critical stories about our immigration policies. Um, However, at the same time, the truth is that we are one of the most generous countries, you know, as far as immigration. Not only, we don't have to look all the way to Australia. We just need to look at Latin America. Mm. Ironically enough. Ironically enough, uh, many people who come illegally to the United States from, say, Ecuador or Guatemala and have to traverse Mexico will tell you that it's the worst experience they ever had. And that when they actually crossed the border to the United States and saw immigration officials, they were so relieved because of all the other immigration officials they had encountered at other borders and how they were treated. You know, and many of these countries have been criticized also in human rights reports about some of the horrible things, including rapes of people crossing the border and demands for bribes, you know. Um, So what to you makes the best of your own reporting on race and ethnicity? You're going to put me on the spot. I'm going to put you on the spot. I'm going to make you say nice things about yourself. Oh, wow. Right? Because you, you're here because your work is included in this book. The I know. best reporting it's on It's always so much ethnicity. better to talk about other people. All right, I'll try. But what I'll, quality? I'll try to think about what my parents would person, But when you do a story that you're really proud of on this beat, what qualities does it usually have? Right. Um, usually, uh, and, and it's not only after I've written it, but during the reporting, I can feel that it's going to be different, to cut above other stories. Um, Usually it's that I feel that I've gone beyond a story about issues and have written a story about people. 
and human behavior. Because ultimately, fears, you know, towards immigrants is really a human condition, fear of the unknown, you know. And so uh, it's something that's in all of us. And I find that people love to read stories about that, that are almost sociological and because they find things about themselves. If I can get you to read a story about immigration, even again, and especially against your will, if it's a story that you really wouldn't be interested in, if somebody said, you know, there's a story about immigration, nah, I'd rather read about the Yankees or the Mets, whichever side you're on. Um, but, if, but if I've done my job and you start to read that story and you find yourself reading it, even though it's not what you would have chosen to have with your coffee, um, you have succeeded. I've achieved. And then if you've learned something, if I've taught you, because I think journalists, journalism at its best educates, educates. You know what? I have severely neglected our callers this hour. Uh, because we've been covering so much interesting ground, and we have about a minute left in the show. Let's give half of that minute to Stefano in Harlem. Stefano, I've got 30 seconds for you. Hi. Hi. It's uh, Stefan Omar, and thank you, Brian. I'm sorry. Hi. For taking my call. It's, it's okay. Uh, what I wanted to say, and, and the lady, uh, I'm very interested in her topic, but, you know, E.B. Du Bois said that race would be the defining issue of the 20th century, not the 21st century. I live here in Harlem. We have a lot of Latinos who have moved down. I'm talking about West Harlem. I'm a stone's throw from the Schoenberg. Uh, we have a lot of whites who have moved in and Asians and whatnot. And it seems like people are getting getting along perfectly. I don't see as much hostility as like I saw in the 60s and whatnot. We have to leave it there because we're flat out of time. I wish we had more time. But there's a note of optimism on multi-ethnic relations, at least in booming Harlem. Right. I think it is better, but it all, it's also more subtle. You know, we don't see the kind of, you know, um, and so that's what we have to be sensitive to. Take heart that it, many things are better about race relations, but also not neglect what's going under the surface. Elizabeth Laurenti, thank you so much. You can read her reporting in the Bergen Record, and you can see more about this book at theauthenticvoice.org. And that's it for tonight's show. We're here live Wednesday nights at 7.30. Next week, reporting on Iraq and photo blogging New York. And don't forget my daily radio show on WNYC New York Public Radio, weekday mornings at 10. Tomorrow morning, how Hillary Clinton and John McCain are already jockeying for position in the 2008 presidential race. That's at 10 o'clock tomorrow morning on WNYC 93.9 FM and 8.20 AM. Have a great night.